Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is April 27th, 2022. Tonight's broadcast is about specifically one intervention that we uh, offer to families. Um, but as always, whenever I talk about an Evoke Therapy skill intervention concept, I, I want to expand it and extrapolate it to, to, to the principles that it can apply, can apply to everybody. So I'm going to talk about walkabouts for, for a minute tonight, a family walkabout. But really, I'm going to talk about Evoke's approach to family work. And this is a mix and match of things. Some of what I did this week, actually, in preparing for this broadcast, was to take some of the recent things that, that I've written on social media. I kind of use my own social media as a, a, sort of a journal about the thoughts that I'm having about psychology, therapy, relationships. And while a lot of my, my focus is on family work, Again, a lot of these principles apply to everybody. When I talk about parenting, I'm not talking about parenting per se. That's the backdrop. That's the content of what I'm talking about. But I'm really talking about how human beings are developed, how we develop as human beings. And when I'm talking about therapy, I'm also talking about parenting because there are so many similarities between providing good therapy, being a good therapist, and, and being a healthy, uh, helpful parent to the process. So that's kind of some backdrop for it. You know, there's there's a lot of things that Evoke does for families, and we have also a separate program, which I won't spend a lot of time on this evening, our intensive program in Midway, Utah, where we host couples, families, and individuals. Um, but one of the oldest interventions that we have at Evoke is something called a walkabout. Historically, a walkabout is when a, when a student is struggling, needs some extra attention, some some two-on-one, two staff, and one student attention, will remove them from the group context and take them on a, a special walkabout. That's two to seven days of two-on-one time. It's not a punishment per se, but it's an ability to focus more, more in a more um, dedicated way to what a child might be dealing with. We also use it as a, as a reward sometimes for children who want that extra wilderness, that backcountry experience. So a walkabout is simply two staff taking a, a child out of the group um, at, at the request of the therapist, at the suggestion of the therapist and the treatment team, and then going out and having an adventure with a specific treatment plan in mind. And for the last 20 years, we've also offered that to families. So if a family wants that extra attention, that, that immersive experience, in the wilderness, they can come out. They can they can sign up with with our staff through their therapist. The therapist will will guide you and direct you through this, and you can come out for for a number of days and spend time with your child and two therapeutic field staff. Like the like, like the individual walkabout, it's going to be designed and 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 created and and then supervised by a therapist in our program. But really, it, it's about just living in our wilderness program. One of the things that I love about a walkabout besides the therapy that happened, is like our program itself, it's experiential. And one of the most important experiential components of a walkabout is you're not the expert anymore. And so often as parents, one of the biggest mistakes, most common mistakes, I should say, that we make is that we think we have to have all the answers. We think that that's part of the job description of being a, a, an effective, adequate, good parent, having answers. And while that's useful and kind of nice to have at times, part of this work is not knowing. Part of this work is being humble. Part of this work is taking your best guess at things, going from your gut. There's a big shift, and I'm going to talk about this at length this evening. There's a big shift between finding the right answer and finding your answer. There's a big shift from what I talk about in teeth that you can't be right or win anymore but you can be a self, which is, is so much better. So we're, we're teaching parents how to experience what their children have experienced and allow the child to lead, allow them to have the answers, allow them to be the experts. Being exposed to the challenges of primitive living, primitive camping, like we do at Wilderness, where we're carrying everything around on our, on our backs and we set up camp to each place we, we go, creates a kind of a vulnerability. It exposes things in us that talk therapy doesn't. One of the early findings in wilderness therapy is that, that the more contrived the experience, in other words, 
the more choreographed or engineered the experience is, the less overall impact it has on the participant. So sometimes the rain is the teacher, the bugs are the teacher, the hot and the cold are the teachers. And so you're gonna have that same kind of experience. When I've been the, the, the clinical leader of a walkabout because it's been my case, I've watched parents with a, when I see them midway or at the end of their experience, I've watched them with a certain kind of humility in their eyes, recognizing that it was challenging and that the, the grist for the mill that comes up in, in, in the everyday living and challenge of being out in the wilderness will, will give us everything we need to work with. Problem solving, communication, frustration tolerance, delay of gratification. Like I mentioned earlier, humility, shifting the, the dynamics so that the child, you're now entering the child's world. So a walkabout can be anywhere from a couple of days to a, to a full week, depending upon uh, a staffing and, and what we have available to, to you. And it's an opportunity to, to live like the students live out there. And then like our, our wilderness program for our adolescent participants, you anchor that with therapy discussions, with therapeutic groups, with family therapy. And in some cases, I've done individual therapy with the parents themselves and process that experience for them. So that's the overview of what a walkabout is. Now I'm gonna talk about the intervention at Evoke in terms of family therapy. I looked this up today because I, I refer to the, the, the family approach at Evoke as a Trojan horse kind of a uh, process. The, the, the horse, the, the gift, like in the Trojan War, is the, the, the fact that we will accept the child, keep them safe, and start working on their self-harming, self-sabotaging, um, their, their, their issues, their symptoms. We're gonna work on that. We accept that as the, as the, as the key to admission. And then once that happens, we, we get out of the horse, once we get inside the village, we get out of the horse and we strategically then talk to the parents about support. These podcasts and webinars came out of that experience. All the family programming came out of that experience. I had a student, this really sweet letter from a student in the field this week asking me, telling me about her, her stay and asked me some questions. And one of the questions she asked me is if you could change one thing at a vote, what would it be? And I said, if I could wave a, wave a magic wand and change one thing at Evoke, I would require more family participation. I would require every parent who admits the child to go to a, 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 an individual intensive, for example. I would require them to read some of the books that we offer and to listen to the podcasts a, a, as a, a price for admission. The problem is, is that people would just to, choose other programs. If we set that boundary, you know, we miss more important than anything, not just those parents that, that, that walked away, but some people that we could help. We would miss the opportunity to help them because we would alienate them before they'd even gotten in, in the door. And as you folks know, who listen to this podcast, who watch the, the live broadcast, it kind of happens to you gradually. You're feeling vulnerable. Your child's out in the wilderness. This is a, a strange intervention and program. And so you tune in to start to listen to, to somebody connected to the program. You, you search the, the website for, for new postings, new pictures, new letters from your child. You, you, you scour that website. And so while your child is here, there's a, a certain kind of readiness that, that happens in the parent in this process. And then once you tune in, you start to hear that I'm not sitting here listing a bunch of, uh, of skills and tools that if you do correctly, you can fix your child. Or if you do correctly, you'll, you'll turn course for your child. I, I talk about your own work, what that looks like, what it means. The fact that we're, we're all in this together and in a, in a fundamental way, I'm no different from you and you're no different from your child. And so I answered the question that way. I said, without not, not that long, of course, I said to her, that's what I would do if I could, but we can't because we would lose people who, who now would eventually benefit from the, from the process. So with that backdrop, with the idea of the Trojan horse and the parent work that we do, I'm gonna share a series of, of quotes, uh, of ideas and concepts and, and teach at each one of them. The starting point is this. This quote reads, safety 
is not the precursor to treatment. Safety is the treatment. And as nebulous as that might sound to you, it's a very difficult process to teach therapists also. See, therapists have this, this energy in them where they wanna fix people. They wanna make people happy and well. And while most people say, well, that, that sounds like a virtue and an asset to them, it can also and is often a, a huge liability because what happens is that energy turns into anxiety and an agenda for a child or a parent, maybe more importantly, to get a certain concept, to get a certain idea, to develop a certain skill set. And when that agenda sits front and center between the therapist and the client or the therapist and the parent, the, the, the therapist loses contact with the parent and the parent or the child can feel misheard or misunderstood in the process. And, and safety, is, like I said, is not the, the prerequisite or, or the foundation that, that leads to something else. Safety is the healing energy. And the irony is, and this, this can be extrapolated to parenting, when I create a safe place for you, the parent, if I can do that, then the wall comes down. And the greatest, really essentially, virtually the only barrier for a therapist is that wall. We call it resistance in therapy. If I can, if I can create a context where you feel safe, information, tools, concepts, skills can get through to you. But if, if there's a wall up, right, a threat because of a, a perceived threat, then it doesn't matter how clever I am or how knowledgeable I am, those things aren't going to get through. Safety heals people. Safety repairs fractured attachments. Safety, um, yeah, I, I've told this story a couple of times, but in, in this, this context, hopefully it can, and it can make some more sense. Some time ago, I was asked to speak. My, my, my brother's company invited me out in Orange County, where I'm from, to speak to their, their year-end sales meeting. They, they bring in one, one or two speakers each year, and the, the, there's, the speakers aren't talking about sales. They're not talking about the product that they sell. But they bring them in as a, a sort of gift from the CEO to their, their, their salespeople, to their staff. And I was that gift that year, one of the two gifts that year. And so I talked about parenting in my first book, The Journey of the Heroic Parent. And my brother, and I'm still mad at him for this, um, he told my mom that I was speaking. And if there's one thing you don't want when you're a, a public speaker on parenting issues is you don't want one of your parents to show up. Luckily, I talk fast, and my mother has a, a little bit of a processing issue because of an accident she had a few years ago. So I think I thought I could lose her. I thought I could kind of uh, speak past her that she wouldn't understand it. But she came up to me and my brother after the, the speaking, and, and, and I spent some time answering questions, and we were sitting in the reception area. And my mother walked up to, to my brother and me, and she said, you know, I, I'm, I'm beginning to think that I should feel guilty. I should feel bad, she said or some of the ways that I treated you boys when you were growing up. My brother was standing there and I said, you know, it'd be nice if you knew what you did, we knew we did well and knew the, mis the mistakes that you made. And, and for you to be able to offer those to us would be a real gift. And I was thinking, especially for my brother who, who doesn't participate in therapy as much as I do um, at all. And I said, that'd be a real gift to, to your children, to your, your three boys, if you could talk about that. The guilt, the, 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 the feeling bad, that's not necessarily my need. It won't do anything for me for you to feel bad about it. In fact, you, you can feel what you want. I can't control that. But I, I would offer to you this idea that the feeling bad, the feeling guilty is getting in the way of you knowing what you did. And while we all know that shame, a very intense visceral feeling of wanting to hide or retreat, uh, to, to, to shrink, is a really powerful barrier to self-awareness, guilt is just as harmful. So what I was trying to teach my, my mother was, if you could feel okay, if you could somehow do some work around guilt where it didn't come into the equation, then you see how it works? You would have access to all the information that, that's hidden behind the guilt. And so, so much of the work as a therapist 
is creating a, a safe environment where the client feels non-judgment, where the client feels okay with who they are. I can't tell you how many times. In fact, I teach this all the time, but this in the last week or so, I, I've had this sentence uttered to me at least a half a dozen times by clients. They've said to me, I wouldn't say this to anybody else, but, or I can't say this out loud, but I feel like I can say it here. Or I know I shouldn't say this, but, and I know that those preambles are leading to something really authentic. And part of my job is to help you as a therapist become who you are, become your authentic self, the self that was lost, that was sacrificed, most likely in childhood, that was sacrificed or, or lost, most likely in childhood, that you gave up in order to take care of your parents, in order to take care of the adults around you. Because if you upset them too much, they just might abandon you. It's built into our DNA as human beings. If our parents get too angry or upset or sad or hopeless, they might be unavailable to take care of us. And because as, as a species, we are the most dependent for the longest period of time on our parents for, for physical safety, for life. To upset our parents is to threaten our own lives, is to put at risk our own lives. That's why ideas like a child that's abused by a parent doesn't grow up thinking the parent is, is abusive or bad. They think that they're bad. It's a safety mechanism, an adaptive response that goes back thousands of years. So safety is reducing the nervous system response. You know, when, I, when I'm talking or, or teaching somebody and I can feel that safety in the room, I can say descriptively, non-judgmentally, very difficult and tough things. Like, like, for example, like I do on these podcasts, you know, of course you dented your child. Of course you have issues. Of course you made mistake one, two, and three. We all do. And, and, and that doesn't make you a, a bad person or a bad parent or unworthy of love. It just means that there's, there's some, the, some work there. So, so safety gives us access to all of us. Safety is the treatment. And when somebody feels safe, eventually what happens in, in parenting, this is called attachment. In therapy, this is called earned attachment, which means that the client through their work earned it for themselves. What happens is the, the, the child or the person, the adult, carries around with them after a while a, a sort of copy of the parent or the therapist, right? Carries a, a, a part of them psychologically with them. And then they operate from that safe place, from that safe base. Safety is treatment. And, and, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. It's, it's related to boundaries too. It doesn't mean laissez-faire. It doesn't mean having no boundaries. Boundaries are, are a different thing that we'll talk about in a minute. A walkabout is an immersive experience, like I described earlier. The goal is for each participant to reflect on their contribution to the issues presenting themselves as pathology in the child. I'm going to say that again, a little bit slower. A walkabout or an intervention is an immersive experience. The goal is for each participant to reflect on their contribution um, to the issues presenting themselves as pathology, as pathology in the child. This can be facilitated by creating a quiet and safe place. In the end, the best way to teach accountability and healthy self-doubt is to model it. Having the answers models for the child rigidity and defense. You know, we have a letter, we have an assignment that we used to call the letter of accountability. We, we shifted it some years ago to the letter of awareness because accountability sounds like kind of top-down power kind of language. It's more about awareness. It's more about knowing yourself. But I have had the question asked of me for, for decades now, um, how do I teach accountability? So many parents want accountability in their children. And the answer is show it to them. Be accountable for your mistakes. 
and when you're accountable for your mistakes and your contribution, I used to say to parents, be 100% responsible for 1% of the problem without qualification. Then your child starts to see what it's like that you don't crumble and die. Some parents are afraid to model accountability because they're still living in that power dynamic paradigm, right? If I admit my contribution, my child will use that as an excuse to blame me for all their problems. That's not the way that it goes. That's in the power paradigm. When you release it, if you were to write your letter of accountability to the child, and it came from that, that place of really wanting to be aware and generous and loving, the child can't use it against you because you don't need anything back. The only reason that they can use it against you is if you need them to think or respond a certain way and accountability doesn't work like that. I wrote this this last week. This is the series of posts that I described to you earlier. For deeper connections, we don't constantly come to our relationships hungry. That applies to, to parenting or partnerships. We come with full bellies, take responsibility for our own happiness and learn to find multiple sources of support. When we do these things, we are more capable of love and are able to attend to the needs of others rather than constantly asking the other to take care of us. I, I cannot overstate what I'm about, about to say to you. And it goes like this. If you show up to your, your, your child, the relationship with your child, unhappy, fundamentally unhappy, and, and ask them to change, partially in connection so that you'll be happy, you tell them how you feel. You, you, you lay that on them as their responsibility. They will grow up with a fractured and limited sense of self. They will then believe that what other people think and feel about them is in fact about them and their responsibility to take care of. Same with our marriages. There's so many toxic ideas in our culture about romance and, and relationships. The idea is, you go get happy and then you come to the marriage happy. And instead of you, you know coming to the marriage with an empty cup and begging for the other person to take care of you, of course, individuals and couples support and love and nurture each other. But it, it, you know, as I've said many times, in my marriage and in my, my relationship with my four children, my happiness, my peace of mind, my, my, my serenity, is my responsibility, not my wife's or my children's. And my wife's happiness is her responsibility, not mine. And ultimately, this transition from being my child to being your own person is the transition from it's dad and mom's job to make me happy versus it's my job to make me happy. This is, this is a painful lesson that I learned. But I spent most of my life blaming other people for being unhappy. Again, I was successful and, and productive in the ways that people would define success in, in many ways. I had advanced degrees. I, I, I made a good living for myself. I had four beautiful, wonderful, intelligent children for the most part. They were wonderful. Um, but I, I was expecting somebody else to take care of me. And it dawned on me uh, about 12 years ago that nobody was coming to the rescue but me. Now, I didn't have to do it alone. I'm not saying that. I had to lean on my therapist. I had to lean on, on, on wise friends that I could trust. I had to rely on, on the folks that I met at my 12-step support groups, my Al-Anon groups, my Codependence Anonymous groups. I had to rely on those kind of people. I had to rely on, the, I started going to a, a yearly group with, with other professional men who were working on themselves, I had to rely on, on them. So I didn't do it alone, that's not what I'm saying, but I had to do it. And in contrast, prior to that, that, that awakening, I thought my job was to change everybody else, to change my children, to change my wife, to change my friends, to change my business partners. And when I went to therapy, it wasn't a, a, an overtly conscious thing but now looking back, it's clear as day. I was going to therapy. I was going to therapy so that my therapist would give me tricks, secrets about how to more 
effectively manipulate the people around me so they would take care of my needs. I knew yelling wouldn't work. I knew fighting and, 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 and lashing out wouldn't work. I was smart enough to realize that. So I thought she might have some kind of secrets. And at one point I remember thinking, I'm going to stop going to therapy because it's not changing anything. Because guess what? I was focusing on changing everything outside of me. I didn't give up because I had nowhere else to go. And I finally figured out the change that, that, that needed to happen wasn't in everybody else. It was in me. I wrote this also recently. We treat addiction as a family issue. This is a really important idea. We treat addiction as a family issue or mental health or depression or anxiety or oppositional defiant disorder. We treat addiction and mental health as a family issue, not because fixing other family members cures the addict or the depressed person, but because everybody is suffering. Each family member is looking for a solution outside of themselves. In addiction, it's a chemical, right? It's a drug. And codependency is fixing my child or my spouse. Each family member is looking for a solution outside of themselves. Hence, all suffer from the same core issue. When a mother and father can realize that they have the same fundamental issues as their child, and, and, and while they might be phenomenally more successful as the world measures it, the parents, that is, that on, on a deeper level, they're just as sick as the child. It's just the child is manifesting the sickness more overtly because they have less developed defenses, less developed coping, you could say, strategies. I have the same issues you all have. You have the same issues your children have. I have the, I have the same issues that my, my mother has. The reason I was able to say that to my mother is not because I read it in a book, but because I saw it in me. You see, I discovered it in me first. And when I found it in me, I could see it in everybody else. This is kind of a, a fundamental evoke idea. You know, we, we talk about constantly about being attachment based. What does being attachment based mean? This is this is this 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 point that I want to make. We know two things in the mental health field. We have a great deal of confidence in two things. The research is, is, is universal. All socioeconomic groups show this, cultures across the country. I've been to attachment conferences where this gets shown in, in Europe and, and in Africa and Australia and the East. It's the same everywhere. We know these two things. A healthy and secure attachment is the most significant contribution you can make to your child's development and mental health. And in case you don't know what a healthy attachment is, a healthy attachment is a secure attachment defined by these two things, providing the child a sense of safety and security and being interested and aware and sensitive to the child's inner world, their, their feelings, their thoughts, their desires, their sadness, their anger, their, their hope, okay? So back to the, the two things we know. A healthy and a secure attachment is the most significant contribution any parent can make to your child's development and mental health. And the research is above 80%. When we see a secure attachment, we see um, children who have developed it in healthier ways as adults. They're, they're well adjusted, they're resilient. The second thing we know is that the best predictor of your ability to provide a healthy or secure attachment to your child is how much you've made sense out of your own childhood. Specifically, it's usually measured by something called the Adult Attachment Inventory by Mary Ainsworth. It's a series of questions that, that are able to, to, to elicit answers that show how much you know yourself, how much you've been able to look at your childhood critically, be descriptive, see cause and effects, see dents and wounds and strengths and weaknesses and so forth. How well you know yourself, in other words. But this is the, the kicker, the most important thing. We know secure attachment is the best thing you can do. And we know that the best predictor is whether or not you've looked at your own childhood. This is the, 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 the kind of magic secret sauce in all of it. The quality of your childhood, mom and dad, the quality of your childhood does not predict whether you can provide a healthy attachment. 
how good your childhood was is not correlated with your ability to provide a healthy attachment. You can have a relatively good childhood, but if you haven't done the work to sort it out, you'll be limited in your ability to parent. So what's the implication in all of this? Do your work. If you're listening to me because you got nowhere else to go and I'm connected to Evoke and so you're just listening, welcome. I'm glad you're here. If you're listening or watching me because you found value in these broadcasts prior to this, I will tell you, this is what I've learned. In 25 years, 27 years actually, 26 years, uh, of working in a wilderness therapy program with adolescents and, and, and tangentially then with their families and their parents, do your work. That will give you the grounding, the peace of mind and the insight, the confidence, the clarity. You'll grieve when your child hurts. You'll be sad when they're sad. You'll be afraid at times when they struggle. All of that will happen because that's part of being human. But at, at a deeper level, you'll have serenity. You'll have peace of mind. You'll have confidence and, and you'll have clarity. So doing your work isn't about you caused it, you broke it, you got to fix it. Doing your own work is it's modeling for your child to do their work. It takes a great deal of courage for parents to send a child out to the wilderness to, to do their work. It's terrifying. It's, it's, it's unnatural in, in a manner of speaking. It's oftentimes, most often, it's sight unseen. It requires a great deal of trust. It feels vulnerable. But parents who make this decision often are at that point where they've tried other things or that they've lost all hope that the child is going to cooperatively participate in the solution. So while all of that is true, the greatest courage you can demonstrate is the willingness to go to your 12-step meetings, to go get a therapist, to listen to these podcasts, to apply it to yourself, to read the books, the parenting books that touch you, that, that matter to you. The journey of the heroic parent is the journey of the parent who's willing to look at themselves. And, and what do our heroes show us? They show us that, that through trial and, and tribulation, and, and, and difficulties, and most often a quest to, to find the answers to, to life's questions, specifically in this instance, how do I help my struggling child? In all of that that makes up their journey, what the hero comes away with is a deeper understanding of themselves, a more authentic version of themselves. And parenting from that deeper, more authentic place, that's the gold in parenting. I thought about this the other day. This came to me as we were having our nightly reedy discussions about psychology and, and, and so forth. I wrote this down. When we realize that human behavior is rooted in trauma, we lose our judgments. But this is also the moment, there are two ways to spell judgment on this particular slide. I spelled it both ways. It probably should just be one way. But this is also the moment we access our clearest boundaries. The minute we lose our judgment is when we access our clearest boundaries because healthy boundaries are inextricably linked to non-judgment. See, people that struggle with boundaries try to change other people. They, they, they lecture, they teach, they fight, they yell, they shame, they intimidate, they plead, they beg. They debate because all of those things are easier than me making the tough decision to have a, a clear, stable, consistent boundary. And I can talk about why that, why that is so difficult. But the boundaries are you do you, but here's my boundary. I'm not saying I'm right. I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm not saying that you're wrong, but this is my boundary. This is my line in the sand. See, prior to that moment, I've been trying to change you my whole life, trying to get you to stop drinking, trying to get you to stop yelling at the kids, trying to get you to stop working too much. I've spent my entire life trying to get you to do that, and I give up on that. And now I'm telling you, you can keep drinking. 
You can keep yelling at the kids if you want. I can't stop you. And I can't go to court and claim you're an abusive parent because yelling at kids doesn't meet the threshold that courts require for any kind of, uh, of, of judgment against you. I can't do that anymore. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave. I'm going to stop this conversation. I'm going to hang up the phone. I'm going to stop fighting. I'm going to get a, you know, I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to get a divorce or I'm going to break up or I'm going to walk out of the room, whatever the boundary is. Healthy, clear boundaries, better boundaries is what I call them are always non-judgmental. We stop looking for villains and faults in others. We start waiting for them to change and we change. And what happens when we change? People rise up to it. Some do. Some fall away. We lose people in this process. That's what we were trying to prevent by, by, by trying to change the other person probably. Is we didn't want to lose them. And then people show up that we've never met because we're a new kind of person operating in, in a new kind of way. D.W. Winnicott is one of my favorite therapists and theoreticians that's ever lived. Donald Winnicott. And he said this about psychotherapy, and then we'll talk about it as it applies to parenting and parenting work at Evokes Approach. Donald Winnicott said, psychotherapy is not making clever and apt interpretations. By and large, it is a long-term giving the patient back what the patient brings. If I do this well enough, the patient will find his or, own, his or her own self and will be able to exist and to feel real. So when our boundaries are, are clear and established, or, or in, you know, as they are, clear and established boundaries, our job is to reflect back to, to the patient, the client, or to the child. But what I try to do in my faulty parenting is I try to talk the kid into something, get him to feel or think differently. Get them to subscribe to my philosophy because, of course, it's the best philosophy, right? Try to get them to buy in. So like Winnicott is teaching as a therapist, when a child says, I, I talked about this in one of my books, when my daughter said, you know, I wish my, 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 my youngest said when we were on a trip together, I wish all of my siblings were dead and it was just us because then we could do this all the time, the three of us, mom, dad, and me. And because I was writing at the time and was tuned in, I said to her, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if it could just be you? And I paused. And she said, yeah, but my sister Emma's my best friend. And I love Jake and I would miss him. And I don't want them to die. Now, if she picked up a knife or a gun and pointed at the kids, I would have set a boundary. There would have been a consequence. I would have intervened. But just feeling that, 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 that rage, that anger, that sadness, that grief, right? When the child says, I want to get a, a nose ring, we can be empathic. We can understand. We can listen. I was doing a training a couple of weeks ago. And, and talking about self-care, and one of the therapists says, what if the self-care for the client is cocaine? And I said, well, I, while I don't think that's a great long-term solution for self-care, what I might say to the client is, you could try that, I suppose. If it works for you, I'm all for it. I used to say to our students, if doing drugs and being mean to people and lying and stealing and dropping out of school worked, I would teach you all how to do it. And when you, when, you, when you take away the battle, the nervous system relaxes, right? There's safety. I remember I had one parent say to me recently, uh, the, the child had said something about wanting a piercing. And, and the parent, what it sounded like, the parent couldn't stop themselves and they said, I bet that really hurts to get a piercing in that spot. And the parent said to me, I know I shouldn't have said that. But, 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 the parent leaked onto the child, right? They had an agenda. They didn't want the piercing. That's what it sounds like when we overstep, when we're intrusive. I remember so confusing our boundaries and empathy that 
I've used this example. I, I was watching it happen to me in real time. Again, my youngest, this was some years ago. We had a Rottweiler, Coda, my, one of my favorite animals I've ever known in my life. He was a big, loving, affectionate, gentle teddy bear. And Liv said to me one day, she said, it's just not fair that Coda, Coda was his name, that Coda can't get up on the couch. And I said, it's not, is it? Doesn't seem right, does it? And she thought I was saying you can ease a lot on the couch because she conflated empathy with, with, with the lack of boundaries because that's probably the way that I taught her. So I was practicing both. I said, it's, it's just an injustice that dogs can't get on the couch. And she said to me, so he can? And I said, no, no, he can't, but it is unfair. Yes, you can be mad at me for sending it to wilderness. And, and you're still going. Yes, you can be mad that you can't go to prom. Yes, you can think that I'm overreacting. Yes, you can think that I'm old fashioned or, or rigid or controlling or X, Y, Z, ad, ad infinitum. But here's my boundary. But I can hear you. Parents just don't know where that line is, right? When clients ask me, I wrote this. When clients ask me, am I a doormat or am I too rigid or uncompromising, right? My response to that question to the parent, to the, to the partner is, you're right. That's the right question. The right question is, are you drawing a line too rigidly, too reactively? Or are you being too self-sacrificing? That is the right question. And the answer is who you are. And the answer is your life and it will take your lifetime to discover it. So you see, even as parents, it's the same work, discovering who we are. To give you a sense of, of how this works in therapy and how it relates to parenting, I took, I think it's my favorite quote from J.D. Gill's writings. She wrote, the experience of seeing one's base, that's, that's one's experience, one's past, one's context. The experience of seeing one's base from a different perspective can be profound. One way this happens is by allowing ourselves to be honest and open with someone who does not react the way our parents did, with fear or, or judgments or agendas or opinions. For example, what was very bad at home is now nothing. The, this difference in experience allows for the realization that things could be different. One's assigned position in one's past is not, the nece not necessarily one's assigned position in the universe. Once we can sit across from a therapist who says, okay, yeah, you screwed up. Yep, you were defensive. Yep, you made a big mistake. Yep, you hurt people. Without reaction and judgment, we feel safe and then we can look at ourselves. That's what this is all about, you guys. It's about finding out who you are. And one of the ways we can do that if we didn't experience that adequately in childhood is spend time with an empathic, capable other who can see us and we start to see ourselves through their eyes. Because the voice that we carry around inside of our head almost always originates from childhood in the way that our parents felt about us. Not, not what they said to us, but what they felt about us, how they thought about us. And if we were a problem, we're going to spend the rest of our life trying to prove that we're not. If they think we're broken, we're going to spend the rest of our lives trying to prove that we're not. We'll create defenses. We will pretend. We'll act as if we know. We'll show up to situations without the willingness to, to receive or listen to feedback. So experiencing yourself in the, in the presence of an empathic, capable other is to see yourself in ways, for most of us, in ways that we've never been seen. When I teach this to therapists in and outside of Evoke, I, I, I'll tell you, very few people have been, have been taught this. I wasn't taught in college, that's for sure. And the reason I wasn't is because my professors didn't know what to teach to me. Because they hadn't done their work. 
They were nice. Some of them were nice people. And many of them were extraordinarily intelligent. But that's not what this work is. This is not about brains and intelligence. That can, that can help and assist. This is about plumbing the depths of who you are. This is about discovering who you are. About owning your stuff. Not just your conscious stuff. That's the easy stuff. But the unconscious drives. That's what gets us twisted up. That's why I spent the first 40 years of my life, like many people and, and men do, trying to prove to the world that I was worthwhile and lovable and wonderful. And what does that look like in, in a man or a person? It looks like narcissism, mainly because it is narcissism. But it looks ugly. And all it is is a scared little kid who grew up believing that he wasn't okay and good enough. You see, folks, part of the secret is when you realize that you're, you're a human, which means that you're beautiful and broken and talented and you're a screw up and you're, the, you're a gift and you're divine and you're pathetic and stupid. It's all of you, right? The goal of therapy isn't to feel happy. The goal of therapy is to feel all of your feelings. But because some of those feelings and the behaviors that came out of them were upsetting and, 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 and disturbing and, and worrisome to your parents, like everybody else, you learn to hide them. And when you hide feelings, pathology pops up in its place. Symptoms. We call them disorders when they're organized pop up in their place. And so the therapist, you walk into the therapist's office, you say, my marriage is a mess. My children are going crazy. I don't know if I'm in the job that I want. And the therapist says, how do you feel? And you're like, why are we talking about that? And the answer is because that's the solution. That's the, that's the way in. I'm happy to take any questions, comments, testimonials, arguments um, from any of you, if there's any. In fact, I'll go over upcoming things and then I'll take, take questions at the end. Um, my two books, as most of you know, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You are available on Amazon and Audible. If you wanna give back, you can go to our charitable partners Choose mental health.org, sky's the limit fund.org, or evoke family foundation.org. Uh, we offer support groups for current and alumni families and, and intensive participants. If you are a current or alumni um, wilderness family, the next available offering is April 28th. That's tomorrow evening at 6 30 p.m. We have one alumni only meeting per month. The next one is May 24th at 6 30 p.m. If you are an intensives alumni, we have one support group per month, May 10th at 6 p.m. Just email intensives at evoketherapy.com or you can always find upcoming meetings on our website. If you want to do a deep dive in your own work, I've already given you the, the clinical rationale. I've already told you, not on this, this broadcast, but another broadcast, I do this for myself. I've done it many, many times for myself and other programs. We have an intensive program for people that want to discover who they are and figure out how that relates to the problems that they're experiencing in life. The next offering, the next in-person offering is May 18th to 22nd. We have a young adult offering. For those of you that have young adults in your life, the next young adult offering is June 10th through 13th, specially designed for young adults. We also have online finding you offerings. June 24th is our next offering. Intensives at evoketherapy.com is the place to go. Um, I'll skip that for now. Uh, if you want a coach, a parent coach, a life coach, a relationship coach, we have attachment based therapists, trained therapists who, uh, provide coaching, just email coaching at evoketherapy.com. If you want a pursuit trip, that's outside of the program, the pursuits program. It's kind of like a walkabout but it can have more adventure and it can be anywhere in the world. My son, I don't know if I've shared this recently. My son, one of my children, when he was 16, did a 30 day 
pursuit trip in the Dominican Republic. And we'd had, we had some letter assignments and some things going back and forth. So it, it's an opportunity to do a program that involves some adventure, some, some, some desirable uh, activities, but also some hard reflective work and some family work. They can last anywhere from three to 30 days. Contact Sarah at evoketherapy.com if you're interested in that. Uh, we ask all current parents to try six 12-step support groups, any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, or adult children. RefugeRecovery.org is a place to go. If the higher power piece doesn't work, it's a Buddhist-inspired recovery program, not specific to one drug, to one presenting problem. Also, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, is a great place to go for classes and resources in your area that are free. All of these broadcasts are available are available on your favorite podcast app or Spotify. Just search Finding You at Evoke Therapy Podcast, or you can go to SoundCloud.com on your computer. You can find Evoke or me, Brad Reedy, on Twitter and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy or at Dr. Brad Reedy, at D-R, B-R-A-D-R-E-E-D-Y. We also have a, an Instagram account for our intensive program using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. On Facebook, you can find us by searching either Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And we have a, a blog that is curated uh, by Malia and contributed to by our staff at all levels. Wonderfully, wonderful, maintained by, by Malia and presented for you for, for new content each week. My next broadcast will be May 5th, 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time. It'll be a Q&A. You can invite family and friends. You can bring any question from this broadcast or not relating to this broadcast, any topic you'd like to talk about. All right, come, questions coming in. One said, my child was at Evoke during COVID when there were no parent visits. Are there other ways parents can experience wilderness at Evoke? Well, you can do a pursuit trip. I guess, I guess I answered the question probably after you said that. A pursuit trip is an opportunity. It could be in our, in our field area, right? It can be primitive living, camping. You can also include, like I said, other adventure activities to it. But a pursuit trip, if your child isn't in the program, is a wonderful way to get rid of your cell phones, get rid of your screens, uh, put all that behind you, go out into the wilderness and, and, and enjoy it, enjoy it, and also get some therapy. So pursuits would be the option. You can also do, if that, that backcountry stuff is too much for you, you can do a family intensive at our, at our, at our new location in Midway, Utah, our, the new home of our intensives is the Alpen Glow Inn in Midway, Utah. You can also follow that account if you'd like to. And if you're coming for a visit, if you're gonna visit your child at a program, come to the Alpen Glow Inn. You'll, you'll, be, ho you'll be greeted and hosted by, by folks that, that know this field, that know why you're there. So if you're visiting Utah, the Alpen Glow Inn is a great place to stay during your visit. So yeah. Any other questions, Malia? No other questions. I hope, I always hope this is a helpful point of contact. I hope it, it gives uh, you some ideas about a specific intervention at Evoke and, and why it can be helpful, the, the, the family walkabout. And I also hope it gives you some relief and peace and empowerment and, and validation for the work that we do to support families. Because when you have a child that's struggling, you need extra support. You need more resources. And so, doesn't matter if you're the, you're the most capable parent ever. When a child is struggling with mental health or addiction issues, you need other people to boo you up, to support you, to make you feel safe and, and warm and welcome and to provide you with ideas that might be helpful for you, for you going forward. So I hope it's a helpful point of contact. And as always, just your attendance means something. For and on behalf of the people that love you and that you love, thank you for showing up and being willing to do your own work. Take care, folks. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.